And not only did he have a relationship with the government, but he had a mole in the FBI. In this world, you look out for number one. Few, if any, people take that oath to the grave. These guys are on the streets, so they're involved in, in hustling. All right, welcome back into the OG podcast. Uh, glad you could be with us talking about that convergence between pop culture and true crime. I'm Scott Bernstein along with uh, Jimmy Bucciolato and uh, Roberto, our producer, uh, on the wheels of steel behind the glass. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, this week we're going to uh, bring in a guest, former uh, FBI agent Jack Garcia, who went undercover into the New York Mafia for two years in the 2000s. Um, had a lot of groundbreaking work uh, in an undercover role, was kind of a, a, a Donnie Brasco 2.0. And then kind of fast forward 20 years and uh, Jack Garcia, an FBI agent, I believe he was working narcotics and uh, had some some background in, in organized crime. And, and uh, him and his uh, superiors decided to uh, target the Gambino crime family, which uh, at least since the 1980s has probably been the most... Um, well-known, high-profile crime family in uh, in New York City. That's where John Gotti came from. Jack Garcia infiltrated a pretty uh, big crew in the in, in the Gambino crime family. A crew that was uh, ran by uh, an old-school capo by the name of Greg De Palma, and uh, De Palma was a, a confidant of of John Gotti's as well as John Gotti's predecessors of Paul Castellano and uh, Carlo Gambino, the, uh, the crime family's namesake. And De Palma was also someone that was very tied into the entertainment industry, was a kind of a conduit for the New York Mafia and uh, figures like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and Liza Minnelli. So, you know, he was uh, a, a pretty high profile figure both uh, in the uh, uh, entertainment industry in New York. He, he ran the Westchester Premier Theater, which was a, a, a prime venue, a performance venue. And uh, then he was also a, an up-and-comer in the Gambino crime family, eventually got promoted uh, to, to a capo spot um, under John Gotti. And, and Jack Garcia uh, got his hooks into Greg De Palma. And eventually from getting his hooks into Greg De Palma, um, was able to dismantle pretty much the entire administration of the Gambino crime family in uh, 2005, took down the boss, the underboss, street boss, and a number of, of, of captains. So uh, we're, we're very honored to, to welcome in Jack Garcia. Jack, kind of talk a little bit about how you got started uh, doing undercover work. Well, you know, it's, um, I, when I was in college, I saw the movie Serpico, and I was uh, taking it back. You know, I, I realized finally my senior year, and football was not in my sights, uh, I decided to uh, say, you know, law enforcement is it. And I wanted to be an NYPD officer. So uh, I went and applied. And, of course, they had big layoffs back in the 70s. Uh, so uh, my prospect of getting into law enforcement, Jordan, really, it were becoming <laughs> less and less. And then uh, suddenly one day I'm watching television and I see an advertisement for Spanish-speaking FBI uh, I agents that were in need at the FBI. So I applied. I figured, let me apply for the greatest law enforcement agency in the world and uh, got in. Didn't even think twice about doing any undercover. I kind of uh, wanted to be like a friend Zimbalist, you know, uh, wearing a, the Thousand Eye shoes, the fedora, and the three-piece uh, suit. And uh, But then I started doing some little light on the cover work while looking for fingertips, and I found my niche. And I think how, why was because I got in at a time in the FBI, which was 1980. I uh, got to realize the demographics of our society had kind of changed. Back then, the agents still all looked like Hoover types, you know, and we started doing more street stuff. And then eventually in 1984, we got involved in, working drugs, and since I speak Spanish fluently, that I fell right into place. At, w at what point did you uh, kind of uh, conjure or invent the, the Jack Falcone uh, persona? Well, you know, uh, people think that I, I've worked organized crime my career. That's, you know, that's incorrect. Most of my experience in the FBI was uh, either posing as a money launderer, a drug trafficker, a drug importer, because of the use of uh, my Spanish. Uh, being that I was born in Havana, Cuba, and I came to this country at nine years old, uh, I, this is all I did. I worked narcotics, and then, of course, I did 
other investigations, police uh, corruption, political, etc., but always around the theme of playing some Hispanic drug trafficker. And one of the guys that I have worked the case on came to me and he said, uh, hey, look, we got this mob case opportunity. We want to bring in an undercover. Uh, I think because of your experience in undercover, as well as the way you kind of carry yourself, you may be able to fit right in. And I said, well, I, first of all, I had no idea about organized crime because I never really worked it. I grew up in the Bronx. So of course, I knew about it. But uh, I said to him, well, you think I could pass it off? He says, well, you know, we'll figure out uh, what you know. And I I looked at it as a challenge. I said, you know, I've done all this other undercover type work. I figured, let me at least try this for what it was worth. And uh, he uh, told me the story that there was a strip club in the Bronx that was being shaken down by these Albanians. And that uh, the strip club at one time was... uh, on record with the Gambino crime family, and to see whether I'd be willing to uh, look into these Albanians, pay them off. And as all of those negotiations and discussions were ongoing, um, a mob captain by the name of Louis Filippelli came in right after the Albanians had come in and destroyed the place and said, look, we can make your problem go away, but you got to pay us in order to keep them out. So they set up a scenario where I would come in, pay off Louis Filippelli and his uh, crew. They called him Bo, right? Wasn't sure. that, isn't that Bo Filippelli? Uh, yeah, Bo Filippelli. That, yeah. that was his nickname, Bo. And the reason he got the nickname Bo, I think every other word out of his mouth was Bo. You know? <laughs> uh, and the guy is a Cardinal Spellman graduate in the Bronx. So I went to Mount St. Michael, which is literally about two miles away. But, um, yeah, so Bo came in and... Uh, we paid him, I think it was $5,000, recorded conversation to him and his people, and it was uh, to keep the Albanians out, and the Albanians never returned. But the interesting thing about it is, is later on, as you saw, and I got into it with Greg De Palma, you saw how the I, they were working together. They would do the old classic shakedown where you create a problem or a situation and you offer an opportunity and a solution. So in this particular case, Albanians came in, they demanded money for protection. Of course, that wasn't happening. And then they called on the mob guys to come in and say, we'll keep these guys out, but instead of paying them, you're going to pay us. So what happened after that, we're assuming that they split the money with the Albanians. But it was your textbook, uh, you know, create a problem and then offer a solution. Reading your book, Making Jack Falcone, one of my favorite parts in the book is when you talk about as you're starting to go undercover or at least consider it, you go to, quote, mob school. And and one of my favorite parts in the book is when you talk about how you, you actually had to learn how to eat like a wise guy. I just I, I love that. I think that's really interesting detail. And could you talk to us a little bit about that experience? And, and as yeah, you point out, you, no, you— That was really interesting because, <laughs> right. again— being the fact that I'm Cuban, I only spoke Spanish at home with my family. Right. And, um, you know, my mom and dad and my sisters and brothers. And all I ever ate was black beans and rice, moros, maduros, you know, all the good Cuban food. And, yes, I had Italian food, of course. But it had to the the actual case agent was a, uh, an individual named Nat Parisi, who was himself Italian. And uh, he sat me down and he said, listen, if you're going to pose as an Italian, you need to know the proper pronunciations of these dishes. You have to know what they taste like, what they're made out of, because a lot of the mob business takes place over a dinner table. And I found that to be, of course, so true. So it couldn't be like, you know, like, for instance, if you were going to have brajol, you couldn't say brasioli. (laughs) Or give me some, uh, you know, uh, marinara. You know, it, it, it had to have been, since the role that they had created for me was going to be someone who was Italian, maybe third generation, but grew up with that background. So as any family members, just like a Cuban, would know how to pronounce moros, maduros, or, you know, black beans and rice, and, of course, plantains, 
they, I had to know that at least I was exposed to this type of food in the past, and it was not unknown to me. Now, just so you know, that was the greatest part of the, my whole training process. I mean, I was <laughs> that, like, yeah, I was going you got to, to eat a, you I mean, got to eat a feast every night. <laughs> oh, every night was a it was a feast exactly. You know, of course, you know how to eat that, the different types of desserts, and you know all of the different foods, and which actually I'm a big fan of right now. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I, th- I think that's so fascinating that you're working undercover and actually cuisine and how to eat and the types of foods and recipes, that actually could give you away if you did not do that correctly. I, I just think that's so fascinating. It really gives well, you some you know, it, interesting we insight. covered every, every basis as far as uh, when you're going to go infiltrate the mob, it's so unlike every other undercover case that I ever did. All the undercover cases, I used to be the boss. I was the guy who ran it. I was the big dope dealer, the money launderer. Or, so there is that kind of, you know, you came in with power. You were talking to somebody with power. But when you infiltrate the mob, there is a lot of deference that you have to show. There is a lot of stuff that goes on in that world that different from every part of the criminal world. It's a complicated so it hierarchy. In a situation where I, was, I, I had to get all the details right, and we know that they went out of their way to kind of verify your bona fides. That all of, you know, it's a world where usually somebody grows up in a neighborhood and they've seen and they see how they interact as kids, as high school kids, young adults, and, you know, and men. So it was one that was going to be a much more difficult than a lot of my undercover. So we wanted to make sure that we had an airtight background or legend, as we call it in the FBI, that it would be, no matter if it was subject to scrutiny, I would be able to pass. So one of them was, of course, you know, I, I had to create an issue about, well, where are you from? So the fact that I was from Miami, Florida, I was third generation. And I left school early. My parents died when I was young. And, of course, uh, I grew up around, uh, you know, the drug world. I was kind of, like, involved in drug dealing. And the good thing about it was I was able to use my informants and sources that I had out there in that drug world in Miami and other places. In the event that was ever questioned, I could rely on having them uh, be my so-called saving contact. But even as far as parents, we went to cemeteries and looked and found Mr. and Mrs. Falcone, who had died at an age time. And the reason why we had to beat that detail is, God forbid, I'm down in Miami, Florida with these guys, and maybe there was a little question as to who I am, and they would say, hey, you know what? You came from this area, Jack. And I knew Miami like the back of my hand because I've done a lot of cases down there in narcotic matters. So I, they would just say, you know, why don't we go pay our respect? We know your parents died. Let's go see where your parents are at. We'll, you know, give them flowers and we'll say our respect. Now, if you don't have that, what do you do? What do you say? So we had a Mr. and Mrs. Falcone that I could go see and deliver flowers to, and I knew exactly where everything was. So in the event they got that far, I would be covered. The only fear I would have that at that same time, the real Falcone kids would be there, and they'd say, who the hell are you? <laughs> right. Yeah, there's zero, zero, was, zero room for error in it, this I think it just operation. Dem- it demonstrates just the, the amount of detail that you have to go in, uh, in well, into creating the, the, the character of, of an undercover persona. Right, and you have to, but each one is different depending on the case that you work. With the mob, they're very detailed. They want, there is that distrust element at all times. There's always like, who are you? Where did you come from? You know, uh, who do you know? We had to, ha- we had a source who was very well liked and respected by Greg De Palma. And he was able to vouch for me that we had met over the years at gambling in Atlantic City and Puerto Rico. And he visited me. My family knew his family. And then, of course, we did all this backstopping where we created this background as to where my money was, which was reality in real estate, but they suspected. And we always wanted to to kind of dangle that carrot of the criminal world that I was involved in really with drug trafficking. 
So you wanted to make sure that if they did, and I know they checked this out because when Greg De Palma later on got me involved in a local union, I had to fill out a form that would include Social Security former addresses. Now, of course, I had to memorize all of these, and they had to be subjected to scrutiny and passed. And I know Greg specifically told me in the past, he said, I know we checked you out. Everything is fine. (laughs) This was early on. So we were expecting that, where in the drug world, somebody doesn't do that because there's always, you know, somebody who knows somebody who introduces you. So that none of that would ever happen. And if even was mentioned, you would get in the person's face and say, who the hell are you to check me out? But in the mob, again, it's that deference, that respect that you have to show, because those are the rules that have been around since the beginning of the mob. You got to adhere to a certain protocol there that maybe doesn't exist in in other lines of uh, undercover work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you kind of describe at the time that you were entering into this uh, uh, undercover role, what the what the reputation of the Gambino crime family was in, in around 2003. And, and just for, for listeners that maybe don't know a ton about the mafia, where they kind of stack up in, in, the, in the world of the five families in New York? Well, the, the Gambino's family had always been the number one family. But right around that time, they were either neck to neck or sometimes, it depends on who you ask, as being the number two. Uh, the West Side, which is the Genovese crime family, they call themselves the West Side, they... Um, they seem to be more of the Ivy League of organized crime. But we were always in this race among them as far as stature. And the reason why, why that's done, it all depends on the number of men, of made men, or wise guys, good fellows, amico nostros, or however you want to call it, are in that family. And those two seem to have the most amount of numbers. It's usually about 250 individuals. And then when you go down and see the other families, like the Lucases or, or the Columbos or the Bonanos, then you start maybe getting in the hundreds. And then, of course, when you deal with Philadelphia and you deal with the Elizabeth crew, the, um, then, of course, those numbers are lower. So it was always like a neck to neck. But the Gambinos had, in my opinion, had an albatross around their neck in a person called John Gotti. He was a celebrity mobster, and yet the chin, he knew how to run that family. They ran under the radar. They accepted pleas. Uh, Vincent Gigante, just for the for the listeners, uh, when he when when Jack just referenced the quote unquote chin, he's talking about Vincent Gigante, who was the godfather of the Genovese crime family. Absolutely, he also was known as the oddball Don because he wore a. Uh, uh, pajamas as well as a house coat or uh, around the city. He pretended he was crazy. The impression that he was crazy, <laughs> but he was sly as a fox. And uh, uh, the chin or gigante, uh, in my opinion, ran the family much better than, of course, John Gotti did. So, but ju- so when you were coming on the scene in 2003, it, it was kind of a, 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 at the point where we were at kind of, a, if you were a Gambino, you were at kind of the John Gotti hangover stage where uh, it had been about 10 years since Gotti himself had, had gone away. He had tried to install uh, a, number of members of his, uh, a number of members of his family, including his son and his brother, um, as kind of front bosses or, or, or acting bosses. And at that point, wasn't there kind of uh, starting to be a shift in the family from the Gottis to some other people and then eventually uh, over to the Sicilian group? Well, yes, it was. But keep in mind that Gotti, we know, went to jail in 90, and I think he passed away right around 2002. Yeah. Peter Gotti was named, uh, the, uh, his son, of course, uh, that was uh, uh, a total train wreck. <laughs> but it, Peter Gotti, who even to this day, still, in my opinion, is the boss by name only, although he's in jail. That's that's my takeaway, that Peter Gotti still had, then you had, of course, the acting boss, which was Arnold Scutieri, who we took down in our investigation. He was a loyalist to John Gotti, as well as Tony McGalley. So you still had that faction going, and I think that after our investigation and after the other large Gambino investigation, you started seeing more of a shift of more of the Sicilians and Dominic 
Cephalu uh, trying to run the organization, and of course, Cali now, um, you know, he's come to the attention. But I still think that because of the law enforcement efforts that we've had over organized crime over the years, this Peter Gotti still dangling out there as more of a, of um, let's say, uh, as the boss, but one without power. Nowadays, being a boss is not good for business for organized crime. Just kind of a t- titular head or a ceremonial boss. Yes, absolutely. That's my take on it. And of course, but you do have the Sicilian influence on there. And it seems like the Gotti uh, name is dwindling. However, we all thought, and I know even I was one of them when they killed uh, um, Cali that Gene Gotti might have been involved. And, of course, that was proven not to be the case. And that's but, another brother of John Gotti. So Peter Gotti, I believe, is, is John's older brother, and Gene would be his younger brother? I think that's the way it goes. Peter Gotti was a garbage man before, but he was also, of course, a criminal. Gene Gotti, in my opinion, is a stone-cold gangster. I mean, he's, he's hardcore. I think it's more than yeah. just your opinion. I think it's <laughs> via, via the court record and, and informants. Yeah. I mean, and he, he just got out of doing 30-plus uh, years on a, uh, a drug and racketeering case, and uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's stone-cold. Yeah, uh, and that's what it is. But they still, the Gotti name is somehow in there. There may be some loyalist involved, but you have to understand, and as you know this, Scott and guys, is that you know the mob has totally shifted their their way of doing business. I mean, they've come to realize that you know leaving bodies on the streets is bad for business. They have come to realize that you know uh, out there now is you want to be sticking to the original roots, which the mafia is supposed to be a secret criminal organization not have celebrity mobsters, not being out there making headlines. They should be out there making money. So they got rid of all their social clubs where they used to hang out and kiss the ring that Gotti requested. Now they're no longer doing that. They put on new layers in the actual structure of organized crime, when in the past you had what they was called the administration, your boss, your underboss, and the concierge. Now what they've done is they've acted in their acting bosses, street bosses. So they're no longer getting the commissions totally together. They're maybe just having messengers. So they're trying to get back into doing what they, instead of moving forward, like all organizations and businesses say, we want to go forward and advance and catch up with the latest technology. They want to go backwards and get back to the original roots of operating in the shadows. And I think they're doing a good job. And personally, I think the FBI, with the restructuring of them no longer being an investigative priority, you may see the comeback of organized crime tenfold five years from now, ten years. Because right now, they're growing exponentially. We don't know that. We have not. We went from five squads in New York alone, one for each family, and two other squads that handle peripheral organized crime to now having two squads. So if an agent is working a case, that means that the whole squad is involved in that case. It's no longer other guys working cases. So yes, there are going to be cases that are still going to go on. There are going to be wise guys going to jail. But a lot of them are going into the shadows. And as long as you have uh, loan sharking, book making, as long as you have extortion, people buying stuff that fell off the back of the truck, you're going to have a mob. Yep. I call, so I the call them not going away. I call them the three pillars of organized crime, extortion, uh, bookmaking, and uh, loan sharking. And as long as those three things exist, and they've existed forever, and they will exist forever, uh, there will always be some form of, of the mob. In your book, you talk about Robert Vaccaro was someone that you suspected was tied in with the so-called Zips, the, the Sicilians. Can you talk to us a little about a, a little bit more about that? I think at one point you were hoping to actually get in close enough with him that you could actually go to Sicilia and meet with some of the Sicilian uh, mafiosi who were um, connected to the Gambinos. Right, and Robert Vaccaro really was an interesting character. I actually came to like him, and uh, you know, I thought he was uh, you know an old school mobster, unlike Greg De Palma, who was you know telephone, telegraph, and tell Greg De Palma, 
which was great for us in the FBI because <laughs> every time he talked, I had a recorder on. <laughs> Robert Vaccaro was different. He was a different guy. He told me that he was part of the pizza connection. We were trying to get to him in which I even suggested, well, why don't we go to Italy, to Sicily? And he knew or suspected that I, too, was a drug dealer. He never asked me. He never talked. But that was kind of the role that I was playing. So we mentioned, well, what one time we should go to Sicily. He said, well, I still know people there, he told me. So uh, this is one of the things that kind of uh, bothered me about this investigation or the shutting down of the investigation was that we never followed that up. And it could have been that he might have known some groups there. Uh, as far as his connection to the Sicilians, I think he has more of a connection, and he had a moral connection with Arnold Scutieri as well as Louis Bo Filippelli. But keep in mind, Arnold Scutieri sold junk too. Mm-hmm. He went to jail for that. So uh, is Vaccaro tied in directly to Sicilian? I think when he did his first jail time on a state level for drugs, because that's what he did time for, he may have connections over there. But he, right now, his loyalties, I've been out of the game now for 13 years. I don't know whether he's tied in with Cephalu and the rest, but uh, if Louis Filippelli is, then guarantee you so is Robert Vaccaro. So for people that have uh, read the Making Jack Falcone book, uh, this will be a uh, a familiar anecdote. But for those that uh, haven't, I would suggest you get out and read it because this was one of the most exciting parts of the book. And I want I want Jack to kind of uh, maybe flesh it out a little bit. So you're at a uh, suburban uh, shopping mall, a, a, a Bloomingdale's, I believe. With uh, Robert Vaccaro and uh, Greg De Palma, and then another kind of lower ranking guy that they called uh, Petey Chops. And uh, Petey Chops was, I guess, being uh, disrespectful to De Palma. And uh, Vaccaro took it upon himself to uh, teach Petey Chops a lesson in the middle of a crowded uh, department store. He, he picked up some type of glass fixture and broke it over Petey Chops' head in front of. Uh, uh, a, 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 a number of probably uh, uh, onlookers that were just kind of uh, their mouth agop of what they had just witnessed. Can, can you talk a little bit about being there and, and, and seeing that transpire? Yeah, that, that was surreal. Um, and the reason being is that uh, Petey Chops, uh, his last name... I, it's Vinci, I Pete Vinci. Vinci. Vinci, right. He was uh, a big loan shark and money uh, and bookmaker in the Bronx. And he was in Greg De Palma's crew. However, he violated for months the rule that you're supposed to, A, kick up, because money always goes up the flagpole, and two, report to Greg. And it was driving Greg mad, not the fact that he wasn't reporting to him, but that he wasn't kicking up. Because all that money meant that he wasn't kicking to Greg meant money was that Greg was not getting in his pocket. So he went on this mission to try to locate this guy, and he asked around. Finally, he had found out that Peter, P.D. Charles, went to Bloomingdale's every certain days. I forget the days. And he would have his girlfriend go shopping while he went into the, uh, there's like a little restaurant up there, had its cup of coffee and whatnot. So he had inside information that on that particular day, which was President's Day, huge sale at Bloomingdale's and at six o'clock that Petey Chops will be showing up. So I being his driver drove him and Vaccaro to the restaurant. <clears throat> now, when we get to, uh, I'm sorry, to Bloomingdale's, we immediately go up the stairs and we go to the, the restaurant that we know him to hang out. And we're sitting around looking at housewares, just chit chatting, waiting to see if we see Petey Chops. Well, sure enough, Petey Chops comes in with two women. Right away, Greg goes on the offensive. He pulls the guy over. He tells the ladies, go powder your nose. <laughs> you know, so they go into the cafeteria, and Petey says, he tells Petey, he goes, where you been? He goes, what do you mean where I've been? I'm being followed. So he says, you're being followed. We're all being followed. That's the game. That's the life we chose. And then they get into this animated stuff. You haven't been showing up. And the guy is saying, it started going up, being followed. I don't want to take a pinch. 
And he says, I don't care about pinch. You come in, and I want you to report tomorrow, and you're going to bring me the fazools. Now, fazools was the term he used for money. So next thing you know, you could see, because I'm standing on the side with uh, with uh, uh, Robert Vaccaro, and Robert Vaccaro is, like, looking at some candlesticks. And I paid no attention because, you know, I had a recorder on, so, of course, I wanted to capture the conversation of these uh, guys going at it. Then suddenly, Vaccaro gets angry, rushes over to where the two were, and he tells the guy, he says, listen, you will show up tomorrow, and enough, but I don't care about you being followed. And, of course, Petey Chow says, who are you? And then that got into, who am I? Who are you? And <laughs> Vaccaro grabs this candlestick, which is like, coast, it's called a Costa Bada, which is made out of hard, really hard crystal, cracks this guy in the head, you hear like a melon popping. Oh my God. This guy drops right down the wall. There's blood all over the wall from his head. And this guy is like knocked out. And he goes to hit him again. So I grab Vaccaro's arm. I go, hey, listen, he's down. We got to get out of here. The cops are coming. So he goes, uh, and, says, and then he drops the, the coast of Boda. And at that time, this guy gets up. He's bleeding profusely. He goes, why did you do that for? Break the palm. I goes. You know exactly why you did. We did that. You and he went on back. All these expletives to the him, and then we started walking back. And this guy is just up and loud screaming. And Vaccaro grabs one of the knives that they had, and he was going to stab him. And I said, <laughs> I grabbed that from him. Right. He says, Come on, let's get out of here. We go down the escalator, and as we get down the escalator, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, <clears throat> security guards that I guess were coming up. And Greg De Palma, without missing a beat, he goes, hey, some guy, the guy over there at the top of the stairs, he fell down the escalator. <laughs> and we get in the car, and we took off. Now, on the ride there, Greg says, and it was kind of interesting the way Greg put on his captain hat. He told the car, he goes, what you did was wrong, you know. He says, you can't put your hands on another friend of ours. Do you understand? And he says, I know. He said, but don't worry. I'll cover this because Petey Chops is signed to me. So if he's got a beef, he's got to come to me first before he goes to the boss. But I'll handle all of that. But he goes, that cocksucker, excuse my friend, better show up tomorrow. <laughs> well, the next day, you know, we get back into, we used to hang out at the nursing home where Greg De Palma's son, Craig, who is also a maid guy, but he um, had tried to commit suicide. Uh, by hanging himself in prison, and he was in a vegetative coma. So we would spend most of the day talking there. So the next day, sure enough, in comes, I see Pete Buccini driving up. He had gauze on his head like Yankee Doodle Dandy <laughs> and walked in, apologized, and I was with Vaccaro. So I said, Vaccaro, there he is. So I said, you're going to talk to him? And he said, F him. And supposedly, Greg, then we went to lunch. Greg said he came in, he gave us money. He said he's going to start. He wanted to know if you were a friend of ours. And he said, and he goes on, he says, and also, Jackie, were you also straight? And I told him, soon you will be. So that, that's the kind of a interesting story that it was because it was surreal. Now, that helped our case tremendously because now there was an act of violence involved in the case. So, of course, now they're in a situation where they have, um, you know, this has escalated their charges by having a display of violence uh, shown in the investigation. So just uh, back up for a second and kind of uh, take us through uh, first, you know, meeting and ingratiating yourself with Greg De Palma and then how you reached a, a status with him over, uh, I think, a two-year period where he, he was ready to uh, vouch for you with the family administration and actually get you made. Well, you know, it was kind of a... Um, and I write this about my book. It was, you know, you can't go in, like, in full force. I had to, uh, you know, I learned from mob school and, and, of course, speaking with other agents and sources before I took on this job. Of course, what we all know today, which money and greed is what drives organized crime, you know. So I, I didn't want to go in there like, you know, all out. I wanted to make myself attractive to him by 
being the kind of guy who kept his mouth shut, but he was an earner. So we did it slowly, methodically. I tried to do the, the whole thing. We discussed where we had some cigarettes from a case that I had before that I offered him and his uh, driver. At so the he, time. Was a bi- he was a big smoker, right? And you kind of, one of the ways you g- garnered favor with him was feeding him uh, stolen cigarettes, right? Or what he thought were right. stolen cigarettes. Well, they were, he thought they were stolen cigarettes, but they were actually counterfeit cigarettes from uh, a case that I was working down in Atlantic City at the same time. But he was a huge smoker. He had only a quarter of a lung. He had surgery and cancer in his lung that were removed. He would take a cigarette that he bummed, and the first thing he would do is take the filter out. Wow. I mean, this guy <laughs> was hardcore. We would say, don't smoke, Greg. You know, you're going to kill yourself. He goes, ah, the hell with it. We all got to die sometime. He literally smoked packs of cigarettes. And what got me, every restaurant that we went to, he, of course, knew the owners. He smoked in the restaurant. <laughs> And there were people sitting there, and I said, Greg, put the cigarette away. <laughs> oh, fuck them. Who are these guys? <laughs> he, he was always he was the most rudest guy you would want to be, and he smoked a lot. So what happened in this particular case, I offered him cigarettes. Of course, he tried to unload it. Not him, but the, the, his driver. They didn't get the kind of money. So then I gave him a, 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 an envelope, which is a, a, you know something within the mob. You're always getting these tribute payments. And I worked him slowly and gradually. I would show up. He would come. I, he kind of like chased me. I was the, you know, I was being hunted by him because he knew that I was around money, that I had money. And I had also I was doing cigarettes. He suspected me doing drugs. Then we got into selling him uh, what he thought was stolen Rolex watches. And they were really watches that we had seized from narcotic and other investigations. Some of these cases were some of uh, my ex-drug dealers that I locked up. We were selling them the Rolex at like bargain prices. They were like 4500 to five grand for this Rolex. He would then turn around and sell it for eight or 9000 So he was making money with, uh, with me, hand over fist, with Rolex, with diamonds, with uh, cigarettes, with... Uh, even we got involved in the television game. So it was kind of where he started wanting to be around me. The next thing you know, I started driving him. We, we forged a friendship. You know, I was with by his side, you know, from the morning until like very late at night. I would drive him here. I would drive him to meetings. He would then, of course, the beauty of him was he had such a big mouth. He would uh, tell me exactly what was happening at the meeting, especially when he met with uh, other mob guys. Uh, so it, it was slowly and gradually we developed this friendship. And then uh, over the course of it, towards the very end, he started talking about proposing me. He did ask me, he says, are you involved in any drug trade now? And I said, well, Greg, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, I was. He goes, I don't care about what you did. Have you not been involved in drugs in the last five years, he said. So I, I, of course, said, no, I'm not doing drugs now or been involved in. He says, good. He says, uh, I'm going to propose you. And he said that uh, he's going to be, uh, um, be the way they were doing it at the time now was that for every individual who had died, uh, every made guy who has died, you can have a replacement done. And then he was going to circulate the list and it was going to go around the family see if ever and I and I of course would play dumb because I found that sometimes since I was supposed to have a background being involved with Cuban drug traffickers that I didn't know that life and I go what do you mean pass my name on the list because don't worry about it we passed the list people look at it they want to know if you're on record with somebody else or there's anything negative about you you know is there anything I should worry about and I said no none at all and then finally you know that's what uh, he left now we found out subsequently at the end to some sources and some of the other families as well as the Gambino family was that, you know, they, there was a list and it, I was included on there. But what set everything astray was the when there was word that Joe Messino had cooperated. So that kind of canceled uh, everything around uh, uh, the last year there. And, uh, of course, the Bureau opted to terminate the investigation. So we never really... 
Just for the listeners to uh, understand, Joe Messino uh, was the probably the most powerful uh, mob godfather in New York City uh, in the 2000s, and he turned government informant, which was just a uh, a, a landmark um, decision on, on his part, and, and really sent uh, just significant ripple waves. Uh, through the underworld, uh, way beyond the bananos, all the way to uh, you know beyond even beyond the the borders of New York City. So you know Jack was working in the Gambino crime family, uh, but the fact that this Bonanno uh, crime family Don, who was I guess you know if, if there was a commission that w- w- was still in existence, this guy would have been you know uh, uh, you know the chairman I guess of the commission. Uh, Joe Massino had uh, had flipped and and. He and Jack saying that his decision to turn government informant then kind of dovetailed with the end of of the De Palma investigation. You know, it was like exactly what you said. Is at that time I remember Greg telling me on they had some connection on the inside, and they heard that somebody big had flipped. That was like conversation. And I said, well, you know, who who is it? Who's the guy? He says, well, somebody. But no one really knew. They just knew that something was amiss. And then finally, when you know when two and two was put together, they came to realize it was Joe Messino. And, and one, like you said, something that big in the mob world happens, you, you tend to just put everything on hold and stop it and, and not pursue it. But also keeping in mind, too, Scott, is that Greg De Palma was very, very angry at what he saw in the mob and who was house getting straightened out. He kept referring that he saw some of these guys, he couldn't believe that they're they were making these guys. Some guys were actually paying to get their button, uh, which simply would mean rather than you play with the rules of of getting straightened out, uh, which is usually you're a guy who makes money, you're a guy who is uh, willing to do time, a guy who keeps his mouth shut, and a guy capable of violence. Usually uh, the kind of the basic requirement tenet of becoming a made guy. Well, the other guys were maybe paying their way to get in other guys were not in his opinion suited for that life so um i think uh, that could have been i was it was all right about timing and uh when the bureau decided i was of course very upset by it uh i voiced my opinion i talk about it in my book i just felt that it was short-sighted uh for that decision to be made because we had an opportunity if i was going to be straightened out that we could have introduced other undercover uh agents maybe throughout the nation to some of the other families. We could have also been more privy to what's happening in, in that world than just somebody that, uh, you know, is an associate, because that will open the doors for conversations. I mean, one of the basic things we learn, uh, and we all know, is that in that world, when you meet another wise guy, you can't just go up to another wise guy and say, hey, how you doing? Says I'm with the Gambinos. I know you're from the Lucchese. You always need a third person to make the introduction. Who knows the both of you? And when you make that introduction, is always I want you to meet Jackie. He's a friend of ours. That tells the other individual that I'm a mate guy. That I'm a friend. I'm part of this this Cosa Nostra. And but if I say to you, I want you to meet Jackie. He's a friend of mine. That puts you on a spot as saying, be careful. You know, he's not one of us. Talk to him, be friendly to him, but don't engage in mob business. And I was tied. It would have been a good opportunity for that to to be part of that. And also at times when Greg met with some Colombo bosses and captain that I would drive, I would be sitting on the table, and then Greg would say, Jackie, I'm going to go over here. And he will move to another table and engage in mob talk. Now, the reason why I wasn't at that table was because I was not a friend of ours. But I wanted to be on that table, and that's kind of what we should have done, get to that table or hear what was going on in there. And that's why, to my opinion, getting straightened out would have been a plus for law enforcement because it allows you to be in that table. It allows you to the keys to the kingdom. Can you kind of uh, maybe reflect on, you know, the, the, maybe the one instant or, or two instances that you felt you were most, um, you had the most exposure, the most chance to get to get uh, maybe found out? Did you ever, were are there ever situations where you were nervous about getting your uh, cover blown? Well, there were several. I mean, uh, I, in hindsight, I, I say to myself, I must have been nuts. I grew up in the Bronx, okay? I went to high school in the Bronx. 
Um, I'm, I went to a junior college and played football in the Bronx. So I, I not Bronx, Westchester, which is next door. So if this case kind of spiraled because originally, remember, it was to take down the Albanians who were shaking down the club. So it was going to be kind of like a cameo. I paid the Albanians, boom, Alex Rudaj and company goes, boom, they go right to jail. But then, you know, the fact that Louis Filippelli walks in, the fact that Greg De Palma gets out, because when Greg De Palma was coming out of prison, that was a shocker. He immediately called us, not us, but the source, and met with him, and he hit the ground running as far as trying to reclaim his turf. And Louis Filippelli told us, he specifically said that Greg De Palma is what it is. He's not going to be involved in this. And then our surveillance team, because they were concerned for my safety, because they thought Greg might be whacked. Because keep in mind that Greg had a pension for talking. Also, when he was in prison, he tried to take out a guy that he straightened out, Nicky Lasorsa, by paying a supposedly hitman that was an undercover ATF agent in prison, which is another whole story, Scott. So we thought that he was marked for death. So our surveillance was on, on Greg all the time, and we kept seeing him meet with all the who's who meeting with McGowan, meeting with the Arnold, meeting with this. So we're saying, what is this guy up to? In the meantime, I'm over there worried about who is going to come in that door to whack Greg De Palma. So as time went on and on, then finally Filippelli came in and he told the source, he said, listen, it is what it is. Greg got his stripes back, which means, you know, he's back to being a captain. He says, you want to be with him or you want to be with me? So we went with Greg because Greg talks a lot. So the decision we made was beneficial to what the FBI, because we knew we were able to gather information because of Greg's telephone, telegraph, and tell the Palma. Did he, did he ever talk about the, the 70s and, and him hanging out with Sinatra and, and uh, all that whole Rat Pack crew? Oh, Scott, it, all the time. He <laughs> lived in that past. Greg was... The problem with Greg was that he was not technologically savvy. He really felt like communications, when we gave him a phone that was wired, he talked freely. The guy was a train wreck. He lived in that past when all of that stuff was allowed. He spoke about his friendship with Frank Sinatra. He spoke all about Dean Martin. He spoke about the Westchester Premier Theater that he claimed was a gold mine. And what they did is they... It's like a typical mob thing, like you see in Goodfellas. Like once you let the mob in, it, it, they blow it out. Whether well, he blew up that whole thing at the Westchester, which was at that time it was Las Vegas, and then there was the Westchester Premier. Then of course they opened up, you know, Atlantic City. But he had all the names. I mean, he had Sonny and Cher. He had Bette Midler, Diana Ross. You, the who's who of entertainment went to the Westchester Premier which is a place which was owned by the mob. I mean, just think about that. That was a mob-owned total place. And he would talk about his uh, golfing. He would talk about his relationship with Willie Mays. He uh-huh. would talk about uh, Leroy Neiman. In fact, the one instance I drove him a few times down to Leroy Neiman's place, and he used to rob Leroy Neiman blind. <laughs> and he would make money by crying the blues to Leroy Neiman about that he knew a guy, he wanted to buy one of his artwork. So he would charge, let's say, a guy 100000 or 50000 He cried to Leroy Neiman, he'd get that same artwork for like 25 or 30 and then he'd sell it to his mark for fifty, a dollars $100,000. He made a lot, of, and while Lehman was in his studio, Greg the Palmer was robbing him because he would bring with him a tube and inside that tube, he would go through the art and just put art in there. I mean, Walk out was, with it. You know, he was, he was, like I said, he was a, 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 a true criminal. I mean, we would go into places. I went one time with him to Rochester, uh, big and tall shop in Manhattan. All of a sudden, I look over. He's sticking socks in his 
in his uh, coat pocket. <laughs> He's sick in underwear. I go, what are you doing? So he goes, what do you mean? He says, what do you mean? You, 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 Bobby Cameron, you put that away. You want that? I'll buy it for you. And he would just, he says, Jackie boy, I can't help myself. <laughs> That's great. These stories are fantastic. The strikes. You know what I mean? It's the spots of a leopard. What do you he think? If, if not help himself, he was a criminal through and through. He would try to rob you. He would rob the Pope. He didn't care about anybody. If I can jump in for a moment, what do you think? This is speculative, of course, but what do you think was in it for guys like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin to hang around with De Palma and play golf with him and go out to dinner with him? What, what do you think? was in it for those guys, to, to be associated with the real wise guy. What, what do you think that meant to Sinatra well, you and De Palma? Know what it is? Somebody once said it, they called it the hoodlum complex, that by being around these guys, you assume their power, you assume their respect. And, and that's what I think these people gravitate to guys like Greg De Palma and to mobsters in general. Because if you're hanging out with a guy who we know would be a gangster, then all of a sudden you got a little extra kick in your step. Mm -hmm. Now you're a little tougher guy. Your chest is out a little more because you are around these people. You have that label. He's connected. And I saw that every single time. I would sit for lunch or for dinner with Greg, and I see people in the business world who literally were financially successful. They had their lives come in and just fawn all over Greg De Palma. Because he simply was was the owner of the one time Westchester Premier Theater, where people had great memories. I mean, I used to go to the Westchester Premier on dates when I was a kid. This was the place to go. It was the hottest place in New York, and I would sit there and I would scratch my head. I go, "What are these people doing? Are they nuts?" And Greg De Palma would take their business card, and then he would walk around with a bunch of stack of Chris of a. Uh, business cards, and he would think, how could I get over on this guy? <laughs> of course. That makes That's sense. what he did. That <laughs> is what they do. They are experts in detecting the fears and curiosity of people and exploiting them. This is what a mobster is all about. It's not because they like you. They Listen, I only hung around Greg De Palma, not because maybe I'm witty, not maybe because I'm funny. It's because he made money from me. He saw opportunity. If I went in there and I told him a joke every single day, it would have nothing to do with me. Everybody's it's a mark. That whole life is about. Yeah. Right. In, in your opinion, what's the movie uh, that that really got it right when in terms of uh, de depicting the mob and, and depicting undercover kind of, work? Yeah. The, and and the, the stuff that you saw firsthand. Well, I, I think the the mob story world uh, it would have to be Bronx Tales. I, I just, I just found that amazing. I think Charles Palmateri, you know, Peg did. I, I, I like the way the, even the, the things about he would have these conversations with the kid that whole life. Uh, I, I think that, in my opinion, did it. Uh, undercover work. I, I, you know, there's so many out there in shows and shows and, and stuff. But I, I go definitely all the time for mob wise. Is concerned that, and then of course the Godfather is. Uh, you know, that's a classic, except part three. But one and two is good. <laughs> I don't. I, I, I guess I'm in the minority. I, I part of me likes three. I like three too. No, I like the Andy. Older, I like but... the Andy Garcia portrayal of uh, of Vincent in, in three. But I mean, there yeah, there definitely are some flaws. It's not quite one or two, but I don't think it's as bad as as everyone makes it out to out to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, well, I guess you know what that people just say it out of a, uh, you know, everybody saying it all the time. But yeah. one and two were really. You know, if I could, fellas had some good things in there, but Henry Hill, of course, was a little bit inflated, you know, uh, the stuff. But I, I, Bronx Tale, how about your opinion? Like, what's yours, uh, guys? Well, I, to me, the, the Al Pacino um, character in Donnie Brasco, um, I think, really captures the essence of the, the, the everyday wise guy. Like, you know, right, uh, right. taking a, a, a sledgehammer to uh, parking meters. To try to you know make a dollar out of fifteen cent. I mean, just I think the the, the impression about the money. You're right. The impression I think everyone has is uh, of mobsters are are you know the, the Joe Pesci and Goodfellas or or the Don Corleone or the Michael Corleone. And in reality, that's that's the 
you know, that's the kind of aberration. Those are the, the high ranking guys, the classy, uh, big money makers, uh, you know, big swinging dicks, uh, excuse my expression. You know, th- those are the exception. The rule are guys that are just spokes on a wheel and, and guys that could really probably work a nine to five job and, and, and be making just as much money as they are as a wise no, guy. You're, you're right. Although every once in a while, as you know, there, there is a tremendous scam that's perpetrated. And to this day, there is none bigger, in my opinion, where guys that I was uh, met along my travels was the biggest Internet fraud ever perpetrated on, on our society. And that was with Richie Martino. Uh, that was with Andrew Campos. That was with Steph Mustafa. And that was with Tori Locasio. They're, they're Gambino guys. They created these 800 numbers, and people were calling that. They were calling that, and then they started they a lot of money. their phone bills of adding. At that time, remember years ago, we would have like their phone bill had like 50 pages. They <laughs> right. killed like millions right. of trees, and <laughs> they would be like a 40% surcharge on something, and that would go directly to the mob. I know Greg told me, which he was a little bit delusional here, but he said that his son had something to do with setting it up, which I I question, but he said that and these guys pled to millions and millions and millions of dollars, but he said it was up in the billions of money that they took internationally. Yeah, they, now, they made a lot of money on that scam. And Andy Campos grew up with Puffy Combs. I know that. Uh, yes, well, he they went to my high school. Andy right. Campos went to my high school. And listen, Andy Campos was a Puerto Rican in my high school. I don't know how he became Italian, but that's another story. <laughs> right? Uh, our producer, Roberto, was just uh, in Las Vegas and visited the uh, Las Vegas Mob Museum. It was fascinating to see your display that they had there of all the tape recorders and uh, the little the little pistols you would carry. <laughs> right, right. Um, and, and I was surprised to see that a lot of these tape recorders were they weren't small. It's not like tech. You didn't have the technology you would have like today. Maybe, you know, this was tape and it was a recorder. And you know, where on your person does that? It go? wasn't James Bond stuff. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, you have to understand. It's all about the time. My I did my undercover was thirteen years ago. Okay. Back then, we used to wear what they call when I started doing undercover. Even in the early eighties, we had to wear what they called the Nagra, and the Nagra was this dual reel thing that would actually get hot and that you would conceal in your person somewhere and run the microphones either to your chest or as I used to do put them by my pants now that led to a, what they call a mini magra which was a little bit smaller but they offered tremendous stereo sound then from there we went into those recorders you saw at the show which was called a, a Panasonic RN36 and an Olympus Sure, they were horrible recordings sometimes. You had to pay a lot of attention when you transcribe them. But now we've gone digital. Back at the time that I was doing it, we had just gotten into the digital aspect. But back then, I was the only one. The other machines that you saw are, of course, for telephone conversations that you record. So the the mob now, even on television, you see that there are recording devices on watches, uh I remember on phones. So we've gone a long way to ensure the safety and the security of undercover agents and actually people recording conversations. But back then, that's all we had was a a recording device, which, by the way, no matter how small you may think it may be, when you're wearing a recorder against a wise guy or a drug dealer, that recorder is 10 times the size in your head. I bet. <laughs> yeah, right. I bet. So we, we, we're talking about Donnie Brasco. I, I think I remember a story of you that um, that you would carry a wallet, and you were told that uh, wise guys don't carry wallets, and that yes. you should you should you keep your money in a roll with the, with the broccoli tie on it, right? Right. Those were all little <laughs> things that, I, I, it, it's so true. There are just different ways that they do things, the mobs, which is really... It's really uh, amazing. Like I even wrote in my book, besides the, the broccoli wire, everybody had that uh, on them. They would take out what they would call a knot, okay, which was this huge, you know, wad of money. And they would always have this wrapped around. And every wise guy, I mean, it was a sign that whenever a check came or you went out, the bigger the wad or the bigger the knot is the more successful you were. If you had a small knot, you were a brokester. 
So everybody before they went out must have gone to the bank and changed all their money, <laughs> the dollar bills or something, you know. <laughs> and then it was just your your behavior, of course. You know, I never had my nails done. What is that nails done? I had to go. I went with Greg to get manicures, pedicures, and and then of course, uh, you know, all of this stuff. It was all about looking good. Your car had to be spotless. And then when you came out, it was all about a show. You wanted to give that impression among mobsters that you were doing good. Because if you're doing good in that life, more things come your way, more opportunities. But if you can't rub two nickels together, who's going to offer you a scam? It's all about earning. It's all brass tacks. That makes sense. Well, Jack, uh, this was amazing. Uh, The insight that you're able to shed uh, for for listeners, uh, it's just invaluable. Uh, This was a great conversation. We kept you a little longer than we thought. Uh, but but we appreciate you you, you know kind of uh, going along with us and 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 telling us the story of uh, of Jack Falcone and uh, everyone go out uh, go to Amazon go to go to wherever books are sold and, and pick up a copy of Making Jack Falcone it's one of the best um, organized crime books ever written uh, Jack lived it yeah thank you Jack it was thank a real you real so privilege very much and it was an honor being here you know Scott keep writing those great books of yours and. Uh, <laughs> You guys uh, are great. I appreciate your hospitality and, and, you know, treating me nice. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Be in touch, man. Take, Take care. Yep.